Well, good morning. A couple of little announcements. Uh, first of all, I very much appreciate the student who pointed out I'd made an error in one of the formulas, and I put a two in the denominator when it didn't belong there. Thank you very much. Uh, if you see anything like that, and you think there are any errors, please draw my attention to them. I'd appreciate if you do it during class and we can fix it on the spot. Uh, it may be that, that perhaps it isn't there, but I should explain it better. Okay. So either way, uh, mm -hmm. if you don't do it during class, if you send me an email, then that, that's also fine. I also check my the notes I give you and I check them and I didn't find any further errors other than the one that one of you caught. Thank you very much. My email at, at school uh, is now working, I think. Um, uh, it's now set up. So, but I would encourage you to use both emails when you email me. The one at home is certainly working. I very much appreciate your questions during class. And I've noticed some of these questions show up in little boxes on my screen. I haven't always caught that. That's an oversight on my part. I'll try and get better. Uh, I'd prefer the questions out loud, but, but you can send the other way if, you, if that's what you prefer. All right, so let me do a recap. We, we started talking about a hole under <coughs> uniaxial tension. Let me do a little sketch. That's what we did last time. There's a large plate. the central hole. These little hash marks means that's the plate. Sometimes in the book that they color this material to show it's the solid material to distinguish it from the hole. All up and down the sides here <clears throat> on this outside part you're pulling this in tension you'll find a tensile traction. Traction is an applied stress. Of sigma nine. And when you do that, you get a maximum stress here and here. It's a symmetric problem, so the maximum stress is the same top and bottom. And sigma max is three sigma naught. And I told you if you want to try and get a feel for, for stress concentrations, then you can think of of a flow, flow of people coming down here. If the people are way up here, they don't even see this. The hole then becomes like a big rigid tank or something like that, something that blocks flow, okay, in this analogy. Mathematically, this analogy is a, would be called a harmonic problem. Sorry? I can't. I can't hear what you're saying. I, I think a few people have forgotten to mute their mics. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And so you can think of this as people <clears throat> walking on a large parking lot, like outside Patrick Taylor, and there's a big tank here. And when they come down here, these people have to divert <clears throat> to miss the tank. So you get a lot more flow here. Okay. And that you get three times the flow. And so mathematically, this is not quite correct. This is useful, or I wouldn't tell you about it. It's because the problem, the flow problem I'm doing is, is called a flow and potential flow. It's a harmonic problem. This is a biharmonic problem. So mathematically, they're not quite the same. So don't be surprised if there aren't some nuances that are a little bit different. And then when people come straight in here, you get compression. So sigma min, and it's the same back and, back and front. Hard, hard to see in my drawing, but like this. So it's compression. And so sigma win is minus sigma naught. Okay. So in this case, we divide the maximum stress by the applied stress and we get a stress concentration factor of three. This is for a large plate.
when you talk about size and engineering, you're always talking relative to something, okay? Well, that would be the diameter of the hole, much large relative to that. So, the height and the width. Are greater than eight diameters. That's the four diameter rule. When you get four diameters away, there's no no effect of the hole. Okay. So that's what you mean by a large plate. This is what we did. Now I asked you a question. A tends to zero, zero which is the same as D tends to zero. D, D is two A. And the hole goes away. You still get sigma max equals three sigma naught. This is a plate without a hole, so how can it have a stress concentration? Does anybody have an answer for that? There was a professor from Harvard who observed this in this solution, the solution by Kirsch, and he said Kirsch must be wrong. Okay. Well, let me tell you, Kirsch is not wrong under most circumstances, but what's happening here? Do you know, anybody have any ideas? Just too modest, huh? Well, I'll tell you what happens is as as the hole closes, here's the hole, and it starts getting smaller and smaller. Like that. Okay. Then what happens eventually is this hole becomes of the order of the atomic diameters, maybe 10 times the atomic diameter, in which case, on, when it's got a very small hole, the atom here starts to see the atom over here. It's no longer stress free. When it's <clears throat> the atomic stress separation law, when you get to about 10 atomic diameters, you, you have no stress, essentially zero. When you get down to two or three, you start to see a stress. So there's an interaction between these atoms on either side of the hole as the hole closes. So the stress-free conditions don't hold. It has to be very, very small for this to be a factor. So in practice, this is never going to happen. Okay? Uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, but I mean, it's, I've never seen it happen, put it that way. Okay. You won't get holes that small. And so even a pinhole, a pinhole is maybe one two hundredth of an inch, uh, something like that. That's nowhere near uh, atomic dimensions, which are in um, micro, uh, micrometers. If this, this stuff is explained in an article in the Journal of Applied Mechanics. Oh, let's see, 2001, I think. So there's nothing wrong with Kirsch's solution as far as you're concerned in terms of using it. We also considered narrow plates. That would be H less than 8D. And when we did those, we did a bit of KT is sigma max over sigma norm, 
where sigma norm is the nominal net section stress. The applied load over the thickness times the net section, which is H minus D. And that's, that's very common. We're going to use normal stresses in these KT. And the, these sort of stress concentration factors are given in either the fifth or the seventh edition in figure 440. That's sort of what we were talking about. Are there any questions on that? Uh, Dr. Sinclair. Yes. Do you mind quickly repeating that, like just a simplified version, just to make sure I got it right? Okay. The, the <clears throat> this, this last part here? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so what the, the sigma norm, so when you have, sigma norm is the average stress through here. Okay, that's what it is. And so, there's the plate thickness T, and it's the place we apply to load P, then the, the gross stress mm -hmm. would be, sigma naught would be P upon H T, the entire height, okay? But the average stress through here is this, it's H minus D, so, it, it, this length here, okay? And as D gets large compared to H, this will be quite a lot bigger than this stress here. And so what this tends to do, this, this normal stress, it, it gets big, so the KT doesn't increase as much. But what's gonna happen for you is whenever you go to these figures, they will define their KT. They will tell you it's sigma max and they'll give you, they may not call it sigma nine, but they'll tell you what the stress is and they'll give you a formula for it. And so whenever you're doing this, Let's see. Here is figure 440. And you see, they define it. And so you just use the definition there. They call it A, and they, that for that A, they meant the net section area. But here they give it, and their notation varies, incidentally. If their notation was constant, I'd just use their notation all the time, but they change it from figure to figure. So you have to look at the figure you've got to see what that stress is. And they're gonna give you KT that is, is going to be the sigma max upon the sigma norm. And here they are calling it sigma norm, which is good, okay? And so, so they're gonna give it to you. Whenever you use these charts, look at what their definition is. Is that okay? Yeah, so just to clarify, the uh, sigma norm is uh, above and below the whole. Yeah, that's right. It's the average stress there. Now, the actual stress there doesn't look like this. The actual stress though, it goes like this. And locally, at the whole, it's bigger. So here's the average value. So what has to happen is the average value drops down a bit. Eventually, it'll, it'll be average it goes something like this. Because the area under this curve has to be the same as it. I haven't drawn this very well. I, I tried to show you this the other day. It drops off very sharply. If I draw it better, it looks like this. Here I've got a diameter. By the time I get to a quarter of this diameter, it will have dropped off significantly. Like this. My guys a little bit lower. Like, that's what the actual stress distribution looks like. This is just the average for there. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Okay. Let me let me do another one of these and, and do some bending. Okay. In bending, we're going to have a different nominal stress. We're going to have a bending stress. Let me do a shoulder fillet. Okay. 
under bending. You know, you have some section of height H. And to fit to some other part, you need to re reduce it for some reason. And so you drop it down. And then when you drop it down, that's called a shoulder fillet. There's this the shoulder here, this height H. This is the smaller height. And typically you try to pick a bigger radius in here as possible because that reduces the stress concentration. Same radius top and bottom. There will be occasions where we have an offset shoulder fillet and the drop is different and, and the radii will be different, but that's not that common. This is, this is the most common. The width, I'm gonna call B. I think that's because in the, let me see, in the figure, I think that's what they, they use. Yes, yeah, okay. But this is a notation in the book. I've used T and B. They use B for different things occasionally. And what we're going to do is we're going to load this with a bending moment in. So if you put the bending moment in like that, you'll compress the bottom and put tension on the top. Okay. Um, you can expect the magnitudes to be the same. The sign will change. This will be tension. This will be compression. The magnitude will be the same. So sigma norm here is going to be the bending stress in the smaller net section, okay, which is there. So it's going to be the maximum bending stress at sigma b max is 4h. That means sigma b max is m c upon i. And in the smaller section, c is the distance from the neutral axis to the outer fiber. So c will be h upon 2. And the second moment of the area would be 1 12th b h cubed. So sigma b max, the h upon two, one of the h's cancels, and the two goes into the 12, six, you divide by a six, then you get six on the top. The h has gone down below. So that, that's the, the nominal stress that's gonna be used. And this is given in both the fifth and seventh edition the, the stress concentration factor is given in the figure 438. So this stress that we're normalizing by if you come out here away from the away from the, the fillet radius, the stress looks like tension at the top, compression at the bottom. That's what it looks like. Okay. What's going to happen because of this fillet radius? This is going to increase and this is going to increase. And the amount increases is given by the KT. And that looks like this. So KT pretty much uniform, a 20% increase or more. And here it's getting increased by almost a factor, approaching a factor of three. Not quite three. But stress concentration factors of three, I wouldn't say it's a really high value, but it's not that common. So, so as you make this fillet radius smaller, then you get a higher stress concentration. That's one of the reasons why you want to put the biggest radius in here. And that biggest radius, that would be the 
for the symmetric configuration, the difference in the height and divide by two. Let me do an example. Here are my specs. I'm going to apply a moment 146 pound inches. Bending moments are usually given in pound force inch, or you could have inch pound force. Torques, on the other hand, in mechanical engineering, are usually given foot pounds. And so when you want to start computing stresses, you need to change those to inch pounds, one of the homework problems or something like that. I'm going to go with the same dimensions I had, for example, six. So I'm going to take H as one inch, little H, seven eighths. And the thickness we had then was one eighth of an inch. I'm going to consider two radii. The maximum we can have, which is H minus big H minus little h, one eighth divided by two, one sixteenth. That's the biggest we can have. And maybe I'll halve that and make it one thirty second. And the question we're going to answer is what sigma max? Um, question there. I'm, I'm not understanding why that would be the maximum radius. Couldn't it, okay. I mean, if okay. you just have two points, couldn't you make the radius as arbitrarily big as you want? Ah, uh, okay. That, that's a very fair question. That's the biggest radius. Yeah, that, yeah I understand your, your question. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So, this is the radius where this is at 90 degrees and this is 90 degrees. That's the biggest radius you can have, okay? And so, this distance here is H minus H divided by 2. But yes, you could put in a bigger radius like this. The problem is here, when you put this big radius in, it's not really a problem there. When you put this big radius in here, it doesn't meet, uh, it meets with a, a little sharp corner here. And so if you put in a bigger radius, this, this radius comes in here and it's tangential to the outer surface. And it's, tan it's at 90 degrees here, but the key thing is it's tangential here. If you put this big radius in here, then you're gonna, this local corner, if here's, your, here's your big radius. It comes down and it hits this, you get this sort of corner, and that's not good. Okay? We'll talk a bit more about that, but that that you want to avoid. That's a sharp corner. And Can you move it up? Very high stress concentration. So you, that's why you can't put in a bigger radius than this. This, this distance here, this is the biggest circle I can put in here. Okay? But a smaller radius, you'd still be able to have it tangential oh, to the yes, bottom yes. one. Yeah, so so th this one here, yeah, fine. This one here, th this is this one. This was one inch, and this was seven eighths of an inch. So the distance between the two is sixteenth of an inch, top and bottom. That was that one. This one here would look like this. Here's my gap. That's a sixteenth. It would come in straight. Yeah, 
straight here and then around like that. There still will be no sharp corner. This will still be smooth. Okay. So that's the 32nd. The six the, the, the sixteenth, I do the same drawing exactly. Would look like this. It's a wee bit hard to see the difference, but this part here is straight, straight for for a 30 second, and then the radius. This has got 90 degrees here, but there's it really could have been from the get-go. Okay. Thank that okay? you. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So we're going to talk more about uh, why that sharp corner is a bad idea later on. Yes. Yes. Okay. We, we will talk. We will talk about it. But you'll start to see it. You, so the, the radius here, that sharp corner, is literally zero. Okay. But that, that if, if you if you smooth that sharp corner, you would have a little radius. And when you when you keep making this radius smaller and smaller, the radius is zero. So that, that that's why it's bad. I mean, you have small radii, but we'll we'll talk some more about that. Okay. So you want to have rounded, you want to round your corners. Okay. You don't want sharp corners. And, and I'm assuming, but but that top corner doesn't matter as much. As, as it turns out, it doesn't. It, it, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a wee bit tricky, but when, when this top corner comes out like this, what this is called a reentrant corner. Okay, this is called a proud corner, and, and so this one doesn't matter. Okay, okay. Um, in engineering, there are some engineers who get confused about that. They think all oh, sharp corners are bad. No, some of them don't matter. This one doesn't matter, but this one does. Okay, the, the, the extreme version of this, of this is a sharp corner like this, the extreme version is a crack like that. Okay, and cracks, and cracks are where things fail. That's a sharp corner right there. But we will talk more about that. Let me do this. So I've got to go get Sigma Nam. And it's written right, in your book, it's sigma m over bh squared, which is just what we got had on the previous page. So it's six times m, which is 146. And that's our, those are the correct inch, uh, sorry, units, pound inch. It's going to be divided by inch cubed, so you're going to get pounds per inch squared, psi. You, you can convert this to uh, ksi, which is slightly better. Six. Sorry, no six there, my mistake. Uh, so B, B is one eighth. And H squared is seven eighths squared. And if I calculated that, that would be PSI. I'm going to multiply by 10 to the minus three because this sort of moment is going to produce stresses in the thousands and so it's easier to work in KSI, but <clears throat> people don't always do this. It's not required. That you work in KSI, you can you can work in PSI. You just be carrying around a bunch of zeros, okay. And if you calculate this, hmm. Is it little h squared? Yes. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm getting 8.0 KSI, 
Uh, I'm getting 9.1. Okay, yes. Yes, 9.15, sorry. I made it. I should point out an example six. Um, we had 9.14. So I picked this 146, although it took me a moment here to do the calculation. I picked this 146 to get the same kind of nominal stress as we had in the previous. Then in, in example six, we were just pulling it, okay? okay. Um, So H upon H is the same as we had in example six at 1.14. I'll do the first case. Can you slide it up? Sure. It's the same as we had before, but let me repeat it. It's just a little bit in one sixteenth into one fourteenth, which is point oh seven. So, going into this chart, we don't have a 1.14, we have a 1.05 and a 1.2. You come in here at 0.7 and you get this value here, which is uh, 1.7, it's almost halfway exactly between these two. This is, when I calculate this 1.9 over here, I got 1.86, best I could read it. And then we linear interpolate to get what, what the value is for 1.14. And linear interpolation for these H's is fine. If you start making R smaller, that this these curves are not going up linearly. So if you start to try and do that, that's good. But going between these curves, linear interpolation is okay. And so the way you do this, you, you want to get the KT for 1.14. So you start off with its value for 1.05. Then there's an income, sorry, which is 1.7. Then there's an increment, 1.85 minus 1.7, 0 0.86, sorry, 0 0.26. Okay. That would be if you go in all the way up to 1.2, but you're not going quite that far. One point, 1.16, sorry, 0.16. You're going uh, to 14 compared to two, and so that's um, nine over 15. Okay. That, where did that come from? The nine, you're going from 1.05 to 14, then <clears throat> 05 from that is 0.09, okay. whereas 05 from, from 20 is 0.15, and I left off the zeros and the points. Okay. So this is... Um, this I get 1.796 let's just say 1.80 and what we used to have in exercise six was 1.87 
So what happens for this class of bending problems? Now we can get the maximum stress. One point. Is 16.5. Okay. We used to have, uh, I think, 17.1. Okay. Sorry for all the crossing out here. But the, what's happened is if you had to, you could just use the tension stress and apply it to, to sigma Norman bending, and you'd be conservative. You get slightly bigger, bigger uh, stress concentration for this class of bending problems. Okay. You can do the smaller radii. And what will happen is the stress will go up. It was it was 16.5. It's the same process, so I'm, I'm not doing it again. To 19.7. So we had a 50% reduction in radius. Twenty percent increase in, in sigma max. Your units are KSI. Sorry? Your units are KSI. Yes, sorry. Yes, all these were KSI. Okay. So th this is I should, uh, underscores the need, but th these graphs show you this anyway, as the radius got smaller, the KT went up. And it's not here, yeah, it's not radical, but it, it is an increase. And so, so you want to make your radii big. And that's why you, you would try and pick the 16th here if you had the option. Okay. And you're just, gonna, you're just gonna increase your stress concentration. Now that, that was bending and the outside plane there where the maximum bending stress is act very similarly to intention. Okay? It, it wasn't markedly different. It was different, but and but there are other cases where bending is radically a different thing from tension. Let me do one of those so you can see that. And let me make it clear the direction of the bending here, and you'll start to see why this is going to be different. Here's this hole. We're going to have a finite height here, quite long plate. So let's think about what the, this is a plate here. I mean, it's not necessarily going to have a large height. Height can go be reduced, so we'll give this a letter H. Well, think about what the distribution would look like if there was no hole. Down the center line. 
without a hope. Can you scroll it down a little bit? Okay. So if it didn't have a hole, it would just be a linear distribution. It had the same magnitude on the outside. Down here would be compression, and up here would be tension. Okay. And it would be zero in the middle. This stress here, because there's a hole, has to get redistributed. And so what's going to happen is you're going to get a little local peak like this. And you won't have any stress there. What's not going to happen? So this is the local. Sigma max. This is the maximum of bending. <clears throat> it's at the outer fibers. There's no hole out there. And then when you get to the hole, all this stuff here has to get shifted to the outside. And this does too. And so you get a local sigma max. So what can happen here is you can have this funny situation where the stress concentration factor is less than one. Have a small hole. Not a pinhole, but a small hole. Then the stress that got redistributed here was pretty low. And so this local sigma max may be less than sigma B max. So if we had KT. <laughs> This is basically what we used to normalize in the previous sorry, seven. Okay. If we normalize, this could be less than one. You still have a this is still a local stress riser. It still increases the stresses here. They're bigger than what they were before, but they're not as big as way out here. When you have a large hole though. If I made this whole way out to here, then this this sigma max street is going to be bigger than sigma b max. That means there's some hole where kt equals one. By no, I mean no bad, no no bad effect. It's no worse having it a hole or not having when KT was one. That's the situation. That'll be something that looked like this. And these two are equal. There's not, this is where the hole is, and there's no stress there. Let me, but if that's the case, then you could use this to reduce weight. If you drill out this material from, say, the side beam of a chassis, which is under bending, 
then what you've done is you've increased the stresses locally, but you've made them no worse than the stress you're designing for on the outside, and you've just reduced the weight. So let's go and see if we can estimate when that's going to occur. So let's look at this stress that we removed here. Let me call this sigma B. Okay, This is sigma B max. This sigma B here will be less than that. Well, this, is, this height here is D upon two. This height here is H upon two and it's linear. So it's going to be reduced by the ratio of D to H. Now we're going to redistribute this. This is the stress here. So it has to be redistributed. I'm going to split it up and say, let me take the, just the top half. In the top half here, this is sigma B, the average value sigma B upon two, plus there's a linear thing that goes this. If you add these two up, you get sigma B upon two plus sigma B upon two, that recovers sigma B, whereas sigma B upon two minus sigma B upon two recovers zero, and that's what you've got down here. And so here's my rough estimate of KT. This is the stress that the average stress through the hole. I'm going to say that's like uh, a hole under uniaxial tension. So I'm going to multiply by three. That's my stress concentration effect. And then this one, I'm going to say there's no net stress here. So I'm just going to add the bending at the top. And if I do that, then KT, I'm gonna to have to divide, I shouldn't say KT, this is sigma max. I'll get KT eventually. Sigma max then, three upon two plus a half, that's two, that's two sigma B. So now let me get KT. My sigma max was two sigma B. And my sigma B max, just that. But we had sigma B upon sigma B max was D upon H. So KT was one with this approach. You, you know, this is an approximate analysis that might work okay for small holes. But <clears throat> let's just see what this tells me with KT was one. So if this is one, then D is H upon two. So that would say, if you want to reduce weight, you can put sizable holes in here. Now, so they inter interact, you want to put them four diameters apart, center to center, like that. Nonetheless, that's some sizable weight saving. Do that. And what will happen with this, if this approximate analysis is correct, 
is that this stress distribution here will look like this. Well, that was just approximate. But this can be done accurately. So there's some questions about how accurate this is. But the underlying physics is not too bad. Here's an accurate analysis. Like right. For this problem, you can get accurate KT. from Peterson. Let me give you this reference. So Peterson's stress concentration factor. It's available in the third edition, written by Pilkey and Pilkey. This is a book. You don't need it for this course. Okay. If we use stuff out of this book, I'll give it to you. So you don't need to buy this book. But when you're out in practice, you may want to get this. Peterson was a Westinghouse engineer and he worked for the nuclear engineering division. And they have serious safety concerns with nuclear plants. And so they wanted the best possible estimates of stress concentration factors. And he put together the first and second edition of this book. And they're largely analytical uh, solutions. Pilkey and Pilkey came along and they did added solutions using finite elements. And I think they did a reasonably good job. We're gonna talk about how to do this finite element in just a little bit. Okay. But what they found, so let me see if I can show you this. Here's the, the factor from this book. This is chart 488. There are about 100 charts for holes. It's, it's a very comprehensive book. That, that said, there's going to be plenty of instances in practice where you can't find it here, but you can find, often find something similar in a book like this. Now, you can start off using your juvenile marshal and see if you can find it in there. Um, but later on in, in practice, uh, you'll be well advised to have a book like this. Well, here, KT was one. And that's when d upon h is 0.45. So this approximate analysis was not terrible. So you would still get quite sizable holes in the side of a, of a chassis there and reduce weight. Actually, I'll give you a formula for this here. You look at this, it looks like a straight line plus a curved line. And I fitted this, and here's a formula so you could have a stress concentration practice for this. This is this is accurate to within one percent. So I define KT. There's some other definitions on that chart. This is one I use for the formula I'm going to give you. The sigma B max. But T is the thickness. Then KT.
So this, the range this works for is just a little bit less than half, up to three quarters of the way through, and this is 1% accurate. So if you have a problem where you want to find the um, stress concentration for a plate with a hole in bending, you can use this formula. When d upon h equals 0.45, it's got a nine there. This will be one, this will be zero, okay? And then when, when it's 0.75, uh, I get what? About 2.5. Six. So it varies from about one to two point six as you go through this range here. Okay. Are there any questions on that? So in this problem you said here, that's just a more accurate. Sorry. You said that's just a more accurate. Um, uh, it, it, it just just so I didn't have to give you the, the chart from Phil uh, from Philby and Berkey or, or Peterson. Okay, Th this is accurate enough for you to use. This is accurate enough for anybody to use. Okay. For, for this problem okay. in this range. Okay. And, and, but yes, it's more accurate. The approximate thing I did, I tried to suggest where this thing was coming from because the stresses that were being concentrated in the center were low stresses. And that's why the KT gets down less than one. When, you, when you're less than 0.45, KT is less than one. Okay. And so you can you could ignore it more or less. Okay. Uh, and it's very close to a straight line. So that you could just remove this part and just take this part. Okay. Uh, that, that would work. Yeah. But that the physics of the approximate method uh, are basically correct. They say the stresses that are being concentrated are themselves small. So when you multiply them by the local stress concentration factor, they're not necessarily that big. And bending itself produces large stresses on the outside fibers. And sometimes they're even bigger than the local stress rate. However, once you get past 45%, that is not true. This KT is bigger. So this situation looks like this. So this weight reduction method probably isn't a good idea whenever there's also tensile or compressive loads. Uh, yeah, yes, typically I, I pick the chassis. That's a good question. I pick the chassis of a, um, of a vehicle. That's nearly all bending, okay? There's very little tension, but you're right. If there was a lot of tension as well, then, then no, you, you go back to that. Um, I forget what figure, figure it is, but it's in the book. We have a hole under tension, and you start having um, a sizable d upon h, then then you would get big stresses out there. Now, the only reason the stress concentration factors were less than three there is because we used a nominal uh, average net section stress, which I discussed at the beginning of class today. But that's getting big. That you know that that if you if you started removing here, I'm going to remove three quarters of it, and then the average stress here would be four times bigger than it is out here. Okay, so. So but this, this stress concentration factor looks like this. So, so when you get a big enough hole, then, then this, this really does get big, much bigger than this. But, <clears throat> Small enough that it doesn't matter. But yes, you're right. If you had um, significant other stresses, then this would not work. This works for bending. And the reason it works for bending is because the stresses that are getting removed by the hole are themselves lower already. And that's not the case for tension. That's exactly right. Okay. Right, one. Any other questions? Why don't we take a break for five minutes and we'll, we'll do, talk about some other stuff?
Uh, professor? Yes. Um, I had a question about one of the homework problems, just, just about where, what, what the concept was kind of trying to cover. Okay, what, what, uh, what problem was that? Uh, I believe it was problem six. Um, it, it's about a pressurized vessel um, and asking for the stresses on it. And then it asks if the pressure was external. And I remember you mentioning a paper that covered external stresses, yes. um, but I didn't know if that was what you were wanting us to use because I, oh, no. able, I didn't see in the book where it mentioned external stresses and which formulas to use. There is something in the book about external pressure. I don't think so. Okay. That, that's what I said. I didn't think so. And but the question asked no. about external no, no, pressure. No. And so but I was wondering what, what you wanted us to do. It doesn't even use. really do internal pressure. It, it gives you some pre pressure vessels are something you're going to encounter. Okay. And my my colleague Jack Holmes, who worked down here for a lot of years, designed a hundred of hundred more. So yes, it was very likely you encounter them. And so uh, these simple formulas, if they're used properly and you use the right formula, work quite well. But um, the book, for some reason, gives you some stresses of the pressure vessel, doesn't tell you how to get them. And so I don't think it discusses that at all. So I gave you formulas for internal pressure. Uh, that was the one that was corrected. The, the hoop stress was P R bar over T. Okay. Uh, R bar was the, the mean radius. That's R plus T upon two. Okay. And the longitudinal stress was P R upon two T. And you can, don't worry too much if you can't get it. Some, some parts of these homework problems are a little challenging. I just want you to think about them, but then we'll give you the answer later. But the, um, think about what would happen if you made the pressure external instead of internal. And it's a slightly tough question for this class because we didn't have time to derive the internal pressure formula. Um, we, we, uh, I would normally have done that in the first two weeks, but I wasn't teaching the class. And so, so don't worry too much if you if you can't get what the right answer is there, but, but think about it and see what you can do. Uh, okay, so so there wasn't a I, specific I don't need, form. You don't necessarily need to go and find that paper. You can if you want to, but, but uh, and that, that would get you an answer. But, uh, but but you can just think about it. Bear in mind, we're just grading this stuff for you thinking about the problems and trying them. That, that's how they've been graded. Okay? And that's really important if you want to do well in this class is to think about these these problems yourself, and then get with people, or get with the work solution, or get with me if you like, and uh, uh, and, and try and figure them out better. But uh, and eventually understand them, and that's how you solve problems by understanding. But understanding doesn't come that quickly. You have to work at it. You can't solve the engineering problems by rote, though, by just memory or method. You, you have to have understanding. But that, this is not that. That, that little question, simple little question, simply stated anyway, it's not that simple uh, with, with your background. And actually, some practicing engineers with their background don't get that right. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I hadn't completely missed something. Yeah, it is, there is no answer in your book, that's for sure. There's a best of my knowledge. All right, let's get back to it. Let we do an, another problem, and this will show you eventually the effects of, um, of sharp corners. And this is the following problem.
I'm going to keep putting the dimension in this direction, or I'll call it A, 2A, which is what we've used in the past. The height of the hole will be 2B, and B is not necessarily equal to A. The way I've drawn it, actually, B is less. If I have this orientation of the ellipse, to use the standard formulas, I'm going to apply the stress this way. And that's going to be a constant stress in a large plate. Well, just like a circular hole under tension, you can expect the maximum stresses are going to occur at the ends here. If A equals B, this would be three times this, and it's going to change depending on A equals B, but, but it's going to be symmetric. This side is exactly the same as this side, maybe not in my drawing, but if the drawing was done correctly. Okay. And actually, if it's circular, you get compressive stress here and you still get that. So, doesn't matter what A, A and B is, sigma min is minus sigma naught at um, 12, 6 and 12 o'clock in this figure. And that's true for any A upon B, doesn't, doesn't matter. On the other hand, sigma max One plus two uh, upon B sigma naught. And that occurs at three in, in this figure at three and nine o'clock. That's a solution by a guy called English about nineteen twelve. We, we, we know a few things we could check this. Uniaxial circular hole. Would be A equals B. In which case we would get <coughs> Sigma many is minus sigma naught. That's what we had before. And sigma max is one A equals B that cancels so three sigma naught. That doesn't prove it's right, but it does pass the checks. The stress concentration factor. On this problem, it's simply sigma max divided by sigma naught. So it's one plus two A upon B. Now, um, are A and B there uh, determined by the direction of tensile stress or by the length of A and B? Sorry, I didn't quite understand. A and B are lengths. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, which, um, in other words, the side that you picked to be A and the side that you picked to be B, was that determined based on the direction of the stress that was being yes. applied or yes. is A yes. bigger yes. than B? Okay, so, so A, yes, that, that's a good question. Now I understand. Okay, so yes, A is, is, or, is in the direction that's orthogonal to sigma naught, B is parallel. Let me write that down. And so I, I could have pulled it this way, but I would have to turn A around through 90 degrees. Okay, so yes. Good question. Perpendicular. Parallel. Okay. And, and you, you've got to keep these directions right to use this formula. Okay. So A is this way and the stress is that way. B is this way and the stress is that way. Okay. So let me do a couple of cases then and see how this works. Let's suppose let's suppose that A is small relative to B. Then the thing looks like this. If A is B upon two, B is much is twice as big as A. The hole looks like this, and you're pulling it this way. So going back to this analogy of flow, if you have a bunch of people walking past this and this gets slimmer, it's easier for them to slide around the side. And so you expect less build up here, and that's exactly what you get. When A is B upon two, then this would be B upon two, 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 it's canceled, so KT equals one. Oh, sorry, one plus one, two. So it's gone down, it's less than a circle. On the other hand, let's make A relatively big. Then the situation looks like this. It's actually similar to what I've drawn before. And now when the flow comes in here, there's further distance to go, and more of the flow gets pushed up to the side. And for this case, KT is one plus two times two is four, it's five, it's a large stress concentration factor. So that sort of makes sense. I can put this all in terms of a local radius of curvature. This is my ellipse. I'll draw it a bit bigger. There's a circle I can fit in the tip here. I can fit a similar circle on that side too. And it has a radius, when we say R. And you can drive this from a little bit of geometry, but R. And KT before one plus two A upon B. I can get what B is. 
B in terms of R is the square root of R times A. So I substitute that in here. There'll be an R down there and an A there. Well, this tells you, you make your radii small, you get large K2. This is why you want to avoid small radii. This formula underscores that. Okay. As a matter of fact, Have a crack, have a sharp crack. And KT goes to infinity. Well, mathematicians have, have mathematically sharp cracks, but any crack in the real world will have an actual radius there, so you don't get this. But nonetheless, the formula is telling you you've got local problems. When R equals naught, KT does equal infinity in this formula. I would tell you that this is qualitatively correct. But you do get large stresses when R equals zero or, or close to it. But quantitatively, after a while, this thing's not right. It's not right. Okay. And we're gonna discuss that. This whole thing here goes to a thing called fraction mechanics, which we will deal with. And I'll talk some more about it. But for now, the lesson for, for you is, <clears throat> this is typical of when you have a local radius, you get this one upon square root. You always get one because you're applying the stress. So you're gonna get one. If the hole wasn't there, A was there, you still get one, okay? But <clears throat> so, so you're gonna see the stress. And then this increase in stress is inversely proportional to the square root. It turns out that this dependence is useful, and I'll show you this next time, for estimating stresses when when the radii gets small, okay. we had a, start looking at any of these plots in here, these things are getting larger, okay, as R gets smaller. And if you use one upon the square root of R, if you do, if you wanted the value for this thing here a little bit closer to zero, you could use that to extrapolate. If, if suppose your H upon H was six, but you wanted an R of say 0 0.02, well, you couldn't read it from here. But if you got this value here and you increased it as one upon the square root of r, then it would be a useful way of doing it. Okay? And I'll show you how to do that. This time. All right, I want to switch and discuss something somewhat different here. Uh, quick question before sure. you move on. Um, 
what are some practical applications to ellipses? Uh, like, does anyone put an ellipse into a plate? Um, no, typically not. But th this um, this was done by English, and by using an ellipse, elliptical hole, um, he could solve it in elliptic hyperbolic coordinates and get an uh, analytical solution. Because this was done about 1912, and they didn't have finite element. However, you, this is very similar to something you do get in practice. Sorry, I'm not quite good. A slotted bolt hole. So this you get. This is quite common in practice. Okay, and so it looks a bit like an ellipse. In fact. Uh, the stress concentration factors for this are in Peterson's stress concentration factors. Okay. And the people who did that with final element, the first thing they did was so they could get this ellipse right, then they got this. Okay. So that's a practical situation. But the nature of the results is similar. So the results here are not ident identical to this, but they're similar. And if you start making the radius here small, then the stress concentration factor will go uh, get very large. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Now, there's a discussion in the book of the importance of stress concentration factors. We will do a little bit more with the elliptical hole, and then we'll start talking about how you get these stress concentration factors nowadays with finite element, okay? And you can get them very accurately. But why do any of this? And the book tells you fatigue problems for doctoral materials are, are really important for KT. So we're on the same page there. When we started off talking together, I showed you a Briggs and Stratton crankshaft, and I've seen two others exactly the same, where the fatigue was initiated right where the stress concentration was with all three of those those crankshafts. So there's no um, disagreement between myself and the book on the issue of fatigue. And if if, if the book Part of the, the section written in the book that I'm going to discuss next was correct, and there was no inference fatigue, there'd be no reason for us to, to uh, consider stress concentration. But I'm going, to, I'm going to discuss a couple of things about this. Uh, the book is, um, it's a good book, but it doesn't get this right. So these are single loads. Fatigue KT are critical. Okay. So there's two instances of single loading, both are discussed in the book. One is brittle materials. Generally speaking, in MECI, you, you design with ductile materials, typically metals. Okay. That's not to say some components will not be made out of brittle materials, plastic, glass, and other things like this. And so then you want to be careful. If there's no stress concentration factor, then with a the brittle material, when you load it up, I 
ideally it would go straight line, it would break at the ultimate strength. Now I'm gonna tell you about some experiments we did with baked Xerox paper. Paper itself is, is kind of brittle. And if you cook it, it becomes very brittle. You may have noticed that you have really old books and they've, they've dried out over the years that if you bend the pages, they can break, okay? And, and our, our data, except for the very last point, which is a little bit off, looked very much like this, okay? We cooked it to about 500 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a book called Fahrenheit 451, where paper is supposed to combust at 451. Well, whatever they put in Xerox paper, you have to get to about 600 degrees. And so we, we dried this stuff out and it was extremely brittle. Then we would say that the failure stress here, sigma star, is SU. But when you have a stress concentration factor, and you get the following. If your component's large enough, okay, I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment, then the stress gets reduced just by the stress concentration factor. Okay. Now the book sort of says, engineers ignore this. Well, they do so at their own risk, okay? Now, if, if the component is small, then, and I'll discuss what I mean by small and large, then sigma star, is somewhere between so what the book is saying is okay if you have just small stress concept it's not okay if you have large what a large well this is this is kind of tricky if you think about paper it's fibrous and as a result of all these fibers these fibers in the places and it has built-in local stress concentrators and they're very small. And when your stress concentration factor, stress, stress concentrated, let's say, to, pick, to fix ideas, let's say it's a hole. When it gets down to of that size, then it just mixes in with all the stress concentrators. Those stress concentrators, you know, when you, when you measure this thing, that's with lots of little local stress concentrators at the end of fibers. And that's what's breaking. It's breaking, the SU is something like Young's modulus upon a thousand. If you didn't have those local stress concentrated, then SU would be something like Young's modulus E upon 10. So they're already present. But if you have a big enough stress concentration factor, you take all these little small local stress concentration factors and increase the stress applied to them. And so you get this, okay? So large and small here means relative to the microstructure of the material, the brittle material you're looking at. I would say therefore that in practice, you better use this unless you've seen some side effects and realize you've got something there. So to start with, you want to use it. Let me show you what happened when we did some experiments with this brittle paper. Done by a guy at Sal Condo. If you confirm something with experiments, that's called validation, okay? If you confirm your numerical analysis with checks and queries, that's called verification. This is a validation. 
and here's what he did. He took a half inch hole in a sheet of Xerox paper. Could you move your paper down, please? Sorry. All right, thank you. I haven't drawn this to scale, but the strip was about 11 inches long, same height as a piece of paper. This is not a scale drawing. He pulled it in tension. A half inch is a lot bigger than one two hundredth of an inch, so it's large. I have put W four point three. And you can go get KT. It's three point three six. When he did his test, he got SU was nine hundred PSI. So star would imply that the fracture stress when this breaks is 900 divided by 3.36269. When you validate something, you're going to have experimental scatter, so you have to repeat your experiments. So he did 30 specimens. How did you pick 30? Well, he started off, I think, with six or seven, something like that. And he got a mean value. Then he doubled the size and he got another mean. Then he doubled the other side and got the 30. At this point, the mean values were not changing. And so then you know you've got enough specimen when you're doing tests. And what, this is what he found. This is an experiment. The mean value was two, six. This is two, six, eight. Sorry. I knew there was a difference here. Two six was two six nine, and the range plus or minus one point nine five times standard deviation was two six one to two seven seven. So. When you have a large enough hole, and you've got a brittle material, you better start dividing by the KT to get your safe stress, okay, to find out what you can apply to it. Don't, don't ignore it. Now, it, it, your microstructure may be different from that of the Xerox paper that Masao used and stuff like that, and you may be able to get some, something lower. And you want to start off, so you want, you want to start off with sigma star equals SU upon KT. There's a brittle material, okay? And until you know that you've got some side effects that are favorable and you can get away with, with more, that's where you want to start. Now, let me talk about plasticity. Otherwise, you're going to have some unpleasant surprises. So, what do you do in this course? <laughs> well, in this course, just use this, okay? And it won't won't have access to size vector. A question comes up to what the stress is for a brittle material. When it's got a KT, you take the ultimate strength and divide by the KT. Okay? In practice, you, as I said, you may well be able to get away with, with it and find a higher failure stress. Good, but you need to go find it. Okay? Don't count on being there magically. Now let's talk about ductile materials. Again, this is still single load.
And the book makes the argument that <clears throat> sigma star equals SU with KT because plasticity smoothing, redistributing Let me show you what I mean. And they have something like this in the book. If you've got a, a hole or some sort of stress concentrator, let, let me do a hole. And initially you have an elastic stress like this, but as you keep loading up plasticity, then it spreads out. And they do this for a stress strain curve. That's elastic. I have a little bump at the end. Okay. There is some truth to this. Okay, this is not wrong. Plasticity does smooth this out. It does. On the other hand, there is no material in the real world that has a stress strain curve like this. Even lead work hardens. Okay. And so, because it works hardening, so this is not quite right. Okay. Actually, what happens here is sigma star is a little bit less than SU. But you, you might get by, you have a safety factor and a few other things by using this. This is not terrible, okay? So this might be, uh, in practice, I've seen it down maybe 10, 20%. Um, but so this is not bad and the underlying physics is, is basically okay. They made an assumption which gives them this and, and this assumption is not true physically. So the result is not quite accurate physically, but it's not too bad, however, this is not the key thing you're worried about in single loading. What will happen if you went load to yield? The applied stress at yield, more often than not, sigma y or s y is the yield strength. Okay. And so you'll start yielding. Well, yielding doesn't break, okay? It leads to large deflections. And so this can be a failure. Let me give you an example. There's a little report that AJ Carter, uh, I did for a local company, Steam and Process Repairs. They, they repair um, things for the oil and gas industry, among others. Uh, I started consulting for them about five years ago because I hadn't done any consulting in oil gas industry. So I'd have some problems to bring to class. But here's one of the things they make. It's called a C clamp. It's a solid piece of steel, okay? When we say it's solid, its thickness is one and a quarter inches. That's a heavy piece of steel. These things are not easy to put in place. And where these things work is you, you put them over Something in here, which might be the flange of a pipe, okay? And, and there would be a pipe comes along here, and there's a flange or there's a join, and there's gasket in between this. And what these things do is, is they lock it, okay? And so if for some reason the gasket starts to blow out here, then these things here keep the whole thing together. If you don't have them here, 
then what can happen is the thing can blow apart and you have to shut down the plant. If you have these C-clamps, it leaks, but then you can decide when you need to fix it. So you can, you can schedule your, your maintenance. Uh, you, re, you appreciate from inspection that stuff is leaking, but it's still working, the plant's still working, and you can find an appropriate time to shut it down and this thing will hold it together in the meantime. Well, what happens here is you get a KT, and it's, it's, it's appreciable KT. This is the, the KT curves in the corners here. You won't get this from Peterson. You could get some sort of rough estimate from a U notch, but it would not be that accurate. The normal stress, the, the load was applied down here. So the normal stress is F upon TH, that's the actual stress, plus you get bending. The bending moment is depth with H, H upon two, F times H upon two, oh six. TH squared. So this is the nominal stress. It's back in there. Back there. And it gets increased. It depends upon your radius. As the radius, um, this, this is normalized by H. And so it's getting smaller here. The KT goes from about 2.4 to 4.48. Okay. Well, <clears throat> and this has got, with final element analysis, this is something we're going to talk about shortly. And yet, you know this is the region where your stress is. We compared these two, and so the stress is higher there. We have a systematically refined mesh there. And we'll talk more about this too. But as you increase your number of elements by factors of four, eventually the stress concentration factor settles down and about 2.44 at this point here. You can get error estimates. The error estimate in this is 0.13%. So what's going to happen then? This state here has one stress, sigma theta. This is one, that's the only stress there. There's no sigma r, okay? <clears throat> On this side, no shear stress. This is like a little uniaxial tension specimen, okay? And it'll start to yield. Okay? And if this yields, this device is no longer any good. The legs go out like this, it doesn't hold the pipe that's coming apart in here, and the thing blows all over the place and shuts the plant down. Okay. So the idea that for one time loading, stress concentration factors don't matter for ductile materials, somewhat correct, you know, even perhaps largely correct in terms of when they would actually rupture. But in terms of yielding, no, what you want to do in, in, in practice is you want to use this. Okay. That now, this, this particular stress state here was like uniaxial tension. And so you're going to have to think about this occasionally. Does it look like uniaxial tension? Is it, is it, in this case here, there was just one stress there on D. We're going to talk more about failure theories and about how you correctly predict when things are going to yield. But, and so this is not always correct because sometimes it's not like uniaxial tension. When you've got something like uniaxial tension, then your stress at yield is going to be the yield strength divided by KT. Okay. That one, for more complicated situations than this, with different stress states, it'll be something different from that, but the same idea will work. So the discussion in the book, the one for bill of materials, unless you know that the size of your stress concentrator is so small that it merges in with the local stress concentrators and you can get strength size effects, that would be like the piece of paper with a pinhole in it, you don't see it. If you don't know that, then you want to use KT to reduce uh, your fracture load, and then you're going to reduce your design loads in the same way. And if yielding is a problem, you better use KT there too. Uh, you probably won't design anything that's close to rupture from plasticity on a first load. And so, so the, using the ultimate strength with, with uh, yielding for a ductile material as uh, the limiting stretch you can have is not too bad. And, and that's what the book kind of shows. But there are other instances where these things matter just with one time loading, yielding and brittle material. Okay, well that's what, all I've got for today. Do you have any questions? All right. Um, let me reiterate, if you want to do well in this class, 
you need to do the homework. That, that, that's absolutely key, okay? And don't worry too much whether you get it right. Ultimately, what matters is that at the end of the day, you understand how to do these things. There are two aspects of, of a good problem solver in engineering. One is they understand stuff. The second thing is they know what they don't know. They're not afraid to admit it. And that, that's what makes people good, okay? And so you want to get in, you don't want to get down on yourself, but you want to get an appreciation for what you don't know and then go figure out how the heck to know it and to understand it. All right, we'll see you Wednesday. Have a good day. I'm sorry. You just can't. We're seeing much of here. Yeah. Do I have to leave meeting? Right.